please join me in welcoming the Emmett Cohen Trio.
Hello, Grand Rapids. Thank you all so much. It's a pleasure to be back in this fantastic venue and in this soulful city of Grand Rapids. Um, I'd love to introduce you to these musicians on stage, some of the great jazz musicians in the world today, playing the drums and cymbals from Milburn, New Jersey, just down the road from where I grew up in Montclair, New Jersey. Uh, we began playing together in high school, uh, fell in love with this music uh, together at the same time, um, went to go hear all the greats uh, at the Village Vanguard, at the Blue Note, at, at, at Small's Jazz Club, at Smoke Jazz Club. We explored. Um, he uh, went on from there to play with the great late Roy Hargrove, um, with Ron Carter, with Jimmy Heath, with many of the other jazz masters. Um, and it's a real joy to have been working with him for over a decade, uh, making music and exploring the possibilities of jazz all over the world. Please put your hands together for the fantastic Mr. Evan Sherman on the drums. <laughs> Playing the double bass this evening from Kingston, Jamaica, by way of Miami, Florida, where we also met in our formative years. He was only in senior in high school and I was in college and he was out playing all the other bass players in town, in, in, the, in the whole school, in the whole city, in the whole state probably. Um, and uh, just a natural talent, made of music, made of art. Um, he's not only a great bass player, but he also sings. He also is a vegan chef. He also is a poet. Um, he's also an accomplished dancer. Um, he really is a renaissance man. <laughs> and. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we have to have a little humor up here, but all those things are true, that's why it's funny. Um, because he, 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 can, he, can, he can get really great at anything he puts his, his mind and his hands on. Um, and it's just been a pleasure to watch his life and his career take off. Um, after uh, moving to New York, he went to the Juilliard School of Music, got a degree from there, and went on to uh, perform with, with uh, Jonathan Baptiste on The Late Night Show with Stephen Colbert, as well as Wynton Marsalis, Branford Marsalis, and many, many, many others, and just uh, came out with his own album and his own new project. So uh, we, we, we welcome him into this world as a band leader as well. And uh, it's been a joy to, to, to be with him all those years and to grow together, which is what this music is about. Please put your hands together for Mr. Russell Alexander Hall. And on the piano, yours truly, Emmett Cohen. Thank you very much. And uh, tonight is very, very, very special. Well, I'll tell you what we played first. We played a song, uh, Old Standard, entitled Time On My Hands. Uh, we started with that. And then that second one was from the Hebrew lexicon, um, something that Evan and I uh, conceived that he heard in Hebrew school once, a, once upon a time, a long time ago, uh, that we, we created a jazz version of, and that's called the Hatsi Kaddish. Um, and this night is very, very special uh, because uh, we have with us one of the great jazz musicians of all time, um, one of the most special composers and musical minds and artistic American figures um, to ever grace the stage. And he... Uh, celebrated 90 years on this earth last year and has another um, celebration of uh, another year coming up this month in just a few days um, and still traveling, still fresh as ever, fresh as daisies we like to say. <laughs> and uh, he is just a complete human being and an improviser full of so much love, full of so much soul and so generous with his time, his music and, and his efforts uh, to make the world a better place. And we'd like to welcome to the stage one of the grand masters of jazz of all time. Please put your hands together for Mr. Benny Golson. Yeah. 
ask Benny Golson. At this point, I usually say it's good to be back, but I don't remember being here before. <laughs> but that doesn't matter, we're here now. And our nexus is the music that we lovingly call jazz. And we are now, for the next few months, going to be a metaphorical family. And we're going to, from this stage, share things that we have in our minds and in our hearts with you, and we hope that uh, they satisfy you. Yeah, in a sense, I guess it's good to be back because maybe you've heard our records. <laughs> anyway, it's an honor for me to be playing with this trio here. They're the best, and that's what we want to involve ourselves with. But you know, as musicians, we travel the world over. We come in contact with different cultures and different people and even different foods. But I'll tell you, we don't need any translators when we play this jazz. And it's my contention that if everybody on the face of this earth for jazz fans, we'd have no more wars. <laughs> Who's going to sit down and listen to Bird and Diz and Miles and Coltrane and then get up with your gun and go out and kill somebody you've never <laughs> seen before? Yeah, it's too bad. But we're trying. <laughs> and you know, I was talking with Sonny Rollins oh, a while ago. And you know, when musicians get together, we invariably talk about the music, of course. And Sonny, and during the conversation, said to me, you know, Benny, there's no end to this music we play. And I thought, yeah, he's right. No musician that I've ever known has said, well, I'll know there is, I know all there is to know and there's no need to know anymore. No, we're always trying to move ahead. And Hank Jones, the late Hank Jones, the pianist, he said to me, Benny, you know, this music that we play and love so much, it's like the horizon. Now, that's pretty philosophical. It's like the hero. What did he mean? And I thought about that, and then I thought to myself, nobody ever says, well, here we are at the horizon. <laughs> there is no such a thing, you know. But in our hearts, we'll never arrive at the horizon. And realism says that we won't. And tonight, we're going to reflect on that by playing our first tune. And guess what the title is? Horizon Ahead. <laughs> As the evening goes on, you'll see I like to talk. <laughs> and my wife says I talk too much. But she's not here. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm from Philadelphia, and as a youngster, an amateur, the old-timers used to give us tips. 
don't do this when you play, do that when you play. And then one day, one of the fellows said to me, now son, when you play, make it look difficult. <laughs> and I said, why? Because if you make it look difficult, your audiences will appreciate you more.
or not. You know, many of us musicians are composers, and sometimes an idea comes and you wind up with a gem. And sometimes nothing comes and you wind up with nothing. <laughs> but one day when I was a part of Dizzy Gillespie's band, we were playing in Boston, I woke up with many ideas running through my mind, and I rushed over to the club. Nobody was in the club, of course, except a bartender washing glasses, you know, like you see in the movies. And I sat down to the piano, and it was one of those days. I had so many ideas that I could hardly write them down. And I'd come up with the tune in about 30 minutes, and then, I realize nobody writes a tune in 30 minutes. This can't be worth anything. And somehow, Dizzy heard it, and he liked it. Well, what do you know? We started to play it in the band. And don't you know, we recorded it. And then other people started to play it. Now. My songs usually have a story to them, but this particular tune had no story. There were just two words that I liked and I made that the title. And those two words were, whisper not. And when I think about that tune, I think about the tune that means absolutely nothing. And we're going to play that tune that means absolutely nothing. <laughs> Whisper not.
I've been working with this group for quite a while, and I've been wondering all this time how the bass player was able to play all that stuff on the bass. <laughs> Tonight, I figured it out. It's the hat. <laughs> I'll have to get one just like it. <laughs> and now I'd like to share my broken heart of a few years ago. It wasn't a love affair, it was something else. I was playing at the Apollo Theater in New York with Dizzy Gillespie's band, and during the break, at the rear of the theater on 126th Street. We were standing out there lollygagging, and we saw our piano player, the late Walter Davis Jr., come from around the corner on 8th Avenue. Now, around that corner was, it was an oasis. There were palm trees, there were camels, there were sheiks. Well, it was a bar. <laughs> and he was coming from the oasis. And as he was walking toward us, we noticed that he was walking quite unstably. And we thought, oh, Walter had been with the wine just a bit too long. And sometimes that used to happen. But we could cover pretty much that with 15 men there, you could cover it. But when he got a little closer, we noticed that he was crying, crying. Walter Davis Jr., a hulk of a man, at least 275 pounds, crying on the streets during the daylight hours. Something had to be amiss. And he got ever closer, and we heard the words coming from him. Clifford Brown had been killed in an automobile accident. Oh, no, my goodness, it couldn't be. It had to be one of those rumors. You heard that Joe died. And you saw him the next day on the street. Joe, Joe, I thought you were dead. Ron Carter told me he died twice. 
But just then the bell rang and it was time for us to take our places behind the closed curtain while some unknown voice was telling you how great the band was. All the psychological ploy to get the audience in the mood as the curtain swung open and the band went into what's known as a flag wave or something loud, something fast. But while all this seeming happiness was going on, many of us were crying because with great incertitude we were about to play that show. And all of that fast, loud sounding music didn't mean a thing because we loved Clifford. And nobody called him Clifford in those days. He was just brownie. Was he really gone? That was the weirdest show I ever played in my life. But when the show was over, yes, Clifford Brown had been killed. It was all on the television and newspapers. And our hearts sank low, low. We had two or three more days left at the Apollo and we would be heading to California to play a two-week engagement there. And when we got there, I thought to myself, we're going to be here for two weeks. Maybe I could write a song about my fallen hero who was taken away at 25 years of age, much too soon. Now during those days, I was writing a lot of songs. And you think I'm some kind of a genius, but that's only because you never heard the dogs that I wrote. <laughs> I mean, during those days if somebody sneezed, I would write a song about it. <laughs> but this song had to be different and it took me almost entire two weeks to put it together. Now, I came in early to work and brought my uniform with me that night because I knew I wouldn't be going back to the hotel. And it so happened that this came in early. Now, Sometimes you think you have a gem and you don't. I'm going to ask Diz what does he think about this tune. And I told him my premise what I was doing, Clifford Brown. Do you have a moment to hear this? He said, sure. Just the two of us in the bartender washing glasses like you see in the movies. He put his trumpet on the table and I began to play. After about seven or eight bars, he opened his trumpet case and took his trumpet out. And I'm thinking, oh my God, he loves it so much he's going to try to play it and he doesn't even know the tune. But he fooled me. He took, us, he took out a plastic flask that he had filled with kerosene and he used it to lubricate his vowels. And while I was playing my heart out, that's what he was doing, lubricating his vowels. And then he poured a little kerosene down the bell of the horn and blew into it. <sighs> the kerosene got all over me and the piano. Oh, I was so disgusted. But I, I finished the tune. And when I finished, he put his trumpet down. And he said, Benny, that's beautiful. What is it? What? Oh my goodness, he was listening. He said to me something that I never expected him to say. My heroes asked me, could he record it? He didn't know. When I was in high school, I used to keep his picture right on the wall at the foot of my bed, dreaming that same dream over and over. Maybe one day I'd be good enough to play with Dizzy Gillespie. And now my hero had come down off the wall and asked me, could he record my song? Nobody knew who Benny Colson was during those days. I could have come right here up on this stage buck naked. Nobody would have paid any attention to me. 
And then he asked me, what was the name of the tune? I said, well, I don't have a name, Diz, but since it's about a friend of mine and ours, Clifford Brown, I might call it I Remember Clifford. But at the same time, we had an 18-year-old trumpet player in the band who was from Philadelphia. And Blue Note heard about him because he was hot. Now, Dizzy had his first recording coming up in a month with Norman Grants. You might remember Norman Grants, Jazz the Philharmonic. But now this fellow had his first recording coming up in two weeks with Blue Note Records. And that was the late Lee Morgan who was playing trumpet with Dizzy. He heard it. Lee was the first to record it followed by Dizzy Gillespie, and you might remember a trumpet player named Donald Byrd. He was number three. I got a big surprise for that fourth recording because I had written a piece about a trumpet player, and I thought that a trumpet player would be recording it. Sonny Rollins recorded it. Now, that was a big surprise. And thereafter, many people started to record it. Now, we're talking about quite a while ago, but during that time, I went to Japan with Ron Carter, and while I was there, now let me tell you about the Japanese. If any one of them are a jazz fan, you could walk up to any one of them and ask, who played third alto with Benny Goodman in 1937? Wham! They'd tell you like that. And one of them asked me, Mr. Golson, do you know how many recordings there are on I Remember Clifford? I had no idea. Over 200. Wow. You never know what's going to happen. About a year later, right, right there in Manhattan, I was asked the same question. Over 400 recordings. Wow, incredible. And they still ask me that question. Last year, sometimes, it was over 500 recordings on I Remember Clifford. And I also found out during the interim that among musicians, they play it at weddings. Unfortunately, they play it at funerals. They don't play them at divorces. <laughs> I remember I was on my way to play a gig in Copenhagen. And sometimes a few people stand there with albums or something and they, they want you to sign before they go in. And this fellow was standing there by himself and as I passed him, he said, may I speak with you just a moment, Mr. Golson? And yes, I, I had time, of course. And he told me that his wife had died two weeks before, and they played it at her funeral. And then he went into great detail. And don't you know, both of us stood outside of that club crying, crying, yeah. That happened because of I Remember Clifford. Well, we're not going to cry now, but we are going to remember Clifford Brown, one of my dearest friends whom I still miss till this very moment. I've played this tune myriad times, but every time I play it, I wonder what would have happened had he not been killed? And I tell many people I wish I had never written it. What do I mean by that? If he hadn't been killed, I would have had no reason to write it. That's why. I remember Clifford.
tell you why I'll do this later. <laughs>